Okay, we talked today about a very important topic in information theory that has to do with the data transmissions over uh, communication channels, and in particular we talk about channel capacity. So, we, this is a change of subject, no more data compression. We focus on the transmission of information from a transmitter to a receiver through a noisy channel which is essentially a random transformation from whatever signal is sent here to whatever signal is received here. In particular, we are going to talk about a class of channels that is a very idealized, very simplified class of channels where instead of signals, in ten, in, it describes like waveforms, uh, electromagnetic waveforms, uh, optical uh, packets of photons, whatever you are going to send through a communication channel. We simply focus on sequences of symbols from an input alphabet, X, to symbols from an output alphabet, Y. So, why this? Well, we will talk later about uh, how this model relates to more physical communication channels. For the moment, we take it as it is. So think about uh, the following problem. We have a source of information producing messages. It's message M is uniformly distributed over a certain number of possible messages. We have an encoder. The encoder is an algorithm that takes uh, the information message and maps it into a sequence of input symbols, Xn, that we call a code word. So we have this code word sequence of symbols sent one by one through a channel represented as a random transformation such that because of effects like distortion, noise, who knows, at the output of the channel we receive a sequence of received symbols, yn, and then there is a decoder whose task is to estimate in fact, recover the original transmitted message. In particular, we focus on a class of channels called discrete memoryless channels, DMCs. Hmm, that are defined by an input alphabet, X, a random transformation described by a probability distribution of y given x, is called the transition probability distribution of the channel, and an output alphabet y. And the property, the defining property of this discrete memoryless channel is that x and y are discrete alphabets. Uh, and the memoryless property is that the conditional probability of sequence y given sequence x splits into the product of marginal terms of the conditional marginals p y given x of y i given x i and in particular this property means that if i look at the probability that at a certain time i the output of the channel big YI is equal to a specific symbol little yi condition on the transmitted message and the whole transmitted sequence at times up to i remember that these symbols means x1 x2 xi and also if we want to con condition on received outputs at time i minus 1, well this is just, all this conditioning goes away as long as it is 
it contains the condition in, with respect to the current input. And so all this conditional probability is just the transition probability computed in yi and xy. Hmm? So in other words, if I condition on the input or, uh, of the channel at time i, the output of the channel at time i is independent on everything else, including the past received symbols, the transmitted symbol up to the present, and the message. So that's a defining property which will be used in uh, proving our theorems and makes things much simpler. There is, of course, classes of channels called with memory, where this property doesn't hold, and those are more difficult to treat. And we will see an example of channel with memory when we talk about the so-called frequency-selective Gaussian additive noise channel, which is, in fact, the model that is say, closer to actual physical ch transmission channels that we use in communication theory. Okay, But this will come later. For the moment, we take this model. So, for the problem of data transmission over noisy channels, we define something called channel coding, or in particular, we consider a block code C of rate R and block length N consists of the following component. Well, first of all, An information message, message set, so the set of all possible transmitted messages. Without loss of generality, we can identify this set as a simply an index set. So we have messages, message 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 2 to the n are possible messages. How many bits per message we have? Take logarithm base 2, so we have n r bits per message. So you can identify the messages as binary strings of length nr or as indices, integers from 1 to 2 to the nr is the same thing. Okay. Then we have a codebook. What is a codebook? It's a collection of all possible code words. So this is a collection of code word number x1, x2, up to x2 to the nr. So you can think of a codebook as a big table with 2 to the nr rows and columns, and every row of this table is a codeword. So if I take the row number m, I find the codeword xm with components x1m, xnm, okay? Now, this table is fixed, is a property of the code. These sequences are not random sequences. You construct a code means specifying one by one, or maybe through a, an, an encoding algorithm, the set of all code words. Hmm? Then we have an encoding function that's very simple. Simply is a map between the messages and the code words such that for message little m in the message set, fm is simply the code word x of m. That's just a word. It's essentially, it's just this indexing of, of, of the rows of this table. That's an encoding function. Then we have an, a decoding function. Decoding function is a mapping between the set of all possible channel outputs to the set of messages, such that the estimated message, m hat, is in the presence of a certain received sequence y, is simply g of y. So it's a mapping that maps the output sequences back to the messages. Okay. And of course, the goal is that m hat is equal to m. If I transmit xm, I receive y, I apply the mapping g. Hopefully, if I have designed this code in a good way, g will give me the message that was transmitted. So I make no error in the transmission of the message. 
So we define the probability of error for a given codebook C and a given message M is the probability that the decoder chooses a message different from little m given that the input of the channel is the code word corresponding to m. This is the conditional probability of error given that we have transmitted a specific message little m. So we call it the individual message probability. Individual me message error probability. Yeah? Then, given the individual message error probability, we can define the maximal probability of error, which is simply the max over all possible messages of the individual message error probability, and the average probability of error, which is simply taking the arithmetic mean of the conditional probability of errors with you know, we transmit the messages with uniform probability, so taking the mean means simply summing them up and dividing by the number of messages. Okay? So with these definitions, we can talk about achievable rates and capacity. So we say that a rate R is achievable if there exists a sequence of n of r n codes, so rate r length n, with increasing n, such that as n increase, the probability, the maximal probability of error goes to zero. So what it means? It means that you know if I want to transmit information at rate r. Well, by the way, why r is the rate? But uh, let me just comment on here. We said that. Uh, we have n r bits per message, and the length of the transmission, so the number of symbols per code word is n. So we have n r bits per message divided by n symbols. The rate r is bits per symbol. So this is the rate uh, of transmission. Imagine r large means that every symbol we transmit through the channel, we carry a large number of bits. R small means that we carry a small number of bits per symbol. Hmm? And of course, ideally, we want to carry a lot of bits per symbol, so we want to transmit at high rate, right? But uh, there is a limitation, and the limitation comes exactly from the fact that uh, we want also a small probability of error. So, uh, with the concept of achievable rate, imagine that the following experiment. Suppose that I am a very good coding theorist, and for a given transmission channel, I construct a family of codes with a given R, so fixed rate, and increasing block length. And it turns out that for this R, when I, if I plot here probability of error versus N, well, I find something that works like this. Ta, 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 ta. It's something that can be made as small as I want, which means that if I have a certain target of probability of error, for example, I don't know, 10 to the minus 6, okay, then I know that uh, there will be some n, let's call it n0, uh, and then if I pick some n larger than n0, then it means that I can control the probability of error to be below a certain target reliability. Yeah? And this probability of error below a certain target reliability is exactly the specs of my communication systems. For example, if I'm using a fiber optical system that transmits at a terabit per second, uh, imagine terabit per second, I want a probability of error that is extremely low. Otherwise, basically, every message would be wrong, right? Uh, messages are very big amount of bits per Per, per block, and uh, uh, if, if I transmit, I don't know, speech, say digitized speech over a wireless channel, I can tolerate a much higher probability of error because uh, the application is more, you know, robust to, uh, to possible errors. So it depends on the application. We have a certain target reliability. The problem is that uh, if we are too ambitious, so suppose that uh, 
I'm not a very good information theorist and say, okay, since I can construct such family of code, why I don't uh, use a larger R? Instead of constructing, so this was uh, my family of codes was at rate R. Now I'm going to do the same at rate uh, R prime, much bigger than R. Because I say, okay, if I if it works for R, maybe it works also for R prime much bigger. And it turns out that if I go beyond a certain bound, it turns out that there is no code. So I can't construct any sequence of codes that matches my target. I am like limited uh, by, well, there is like a, a sort of wall that I cannot overcome. So the story is, for every given channel, we have a set of rates up to a certain limit for which we can control the probability of error to become arbitrarily small. And if we go beyond this limit, so we are too ambitious in the transmission rate, suddenly we cannot find any code, even if we are the best possible, you know, crazy engineers in Silicon Valley thinking out of the box, well, there is a fundamental wall we cannot control the probability of error anymore. So this limit is called the channel capacity. So the channel capacity is the supremum of all achievable rates. Supremum means maximum, but in fact is a maximum that you do not achieve, you approach arbitrarily close. Mm -hmm. So this definition is it's called an operational definition of capacity. So we define the capacity as the supremum of all achievable rates, meaning that for every rate below capacity, there exist sequences of codes with arbitrarily low probability of error as n goes to infinity. For every rate above capacity, these sequences of codes do not exist. Okay? Now, our goal will be to find an explicit characterization, meaning a formula, for the channel capacity for a given channel. So in other words, we have a given channel with a certain transition probability, P, Y, given X, find this limit C and be able to compute it. Clearly, you can see that uh, computing the limit by explicitly construction, constructing optimal sequences of codes and see until we can find those codes is clearly unfeasible, right? Because constructing codes is a very hard task. So here we need to prove the existence of such codes and for the converse part, to prove the non-existence of such codes for rate respectively below and above capacity. If we can find so-called achievability and converse that match, then we have determined the channel capacity without constructing the codes. We have just to prove their existence without constructing them. So this is the, in a certain sense, the really smart idea that Shannon had. And the, the approach, the proof approach is, uh, well, there are many ways of proving this uh, result, especially for DMCs. Uh, we are going to follow one approach, which is relatively simple, and that uses uh, joint typicality and the packing lemma that we have seen last week. Okay, so this is the setup of the problem. Let me give you some examples of DMCs. So, in order to represent a probability, a transition probability for a channel, so PY given X, or little y given little x, we have several ways. For example, PY given X is a table, right? For every X and every Y, we have the value 
t y given x of little y given little x. Remember that conditional probability distributions are such that for every row of this table is a probability mass function for y. So we can see this as a table of probability mass functions indexed by the conditioning input x that gives the probability of y given that x. Every row gives it how y is distributed given that I have transmitted that x. I can also use these diagrams. Sometimes they are more expressive. What are these diagrams? These diagrams represent, in a graphical way, the same thing, the transition probabilities. For example, this diagram says that if I enumerate the input symbols 1, 2, 3, and 4, if I transmit 1, I will, and let's say I enumerate also the output symbol in the same way, if I transmit 1, I can receive 1 or 2 with probability 1 half, 1 half. If I transmit 2, I can receive 2 or 3 with probability 1 half, 1 half. If I transmit 3, etc., etc., right? Same thing. The number of, uh, of um, uh, input symbols and output symbols need not be the same. So in this case, the alphabet X and the alphabet Y are the same alphabet. But in this case, for example, the alphabet X is, say, 0, 1, and the alphabet Y is, I don't know, A, B, C, and D. No problem. Everything is perfectly defined, and you have transition probabilities from the two inputs to the outputs, or same here, same in the third example. So those are simply graphical representations of these transition probability matrix, okay? Good. So, in some channels, we can achieve zero error probability. Um, how? Well, think about the channel like this which is, by the way, is a generalization of, of the first example A here. Some people call it the noisy typewriter. Noisy typewriter means that, uh, okay, we have, uh, you know, uh, input alphabet, output alphabet, and for every input letter, we can receive that letter or the next one. And the last one, of course, goes back, is that letter or the first. So basically, this is like a, 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 a cyclic, cyclic map, okay? Now, it's clear that uh, if you transmit, if you use all the symbols, the channel makes error. You transmit symbol one, and the channel may give you one or two, okay? Well, in this special case, a very simple way to achieve zero error probability consists of, well, just use half of the symbols. If we just use half of the symbols, so we reduce the rate, because at the end, the logarithm of the number of used symbols is, uh, uh, is the rate, is the number of bits per symbol we can transmit. If I only use half of the symbols, you see that I can uh, transmit symbol one, and then I receive this possible set, transmit symbol 3, and I receive this possible set, and this set are disjoint. So it's very easy for the decoder to undo the effect of the channel. If the decoder receives 1 or 2, knows that 1 was transmitted. If it receives 3 or 4, knows that 3 was transmitted, and so on and so forth. So the decoder can perfectly undo the effect of the channel. And this is thanks to the fact that we have selected a subset of the symbols with the property that they're fun out. So the symbols generated by the channel in the presence of the transmission of one of those symbols are disjoint. 
So we, we have created a partition of the output alphabet into disjoint bubbles so that the operation between those bubbles and the transmitted symbols, in fact, is uh, is one to one. Mm? So it's invertible. So the decoder can perfectly invert what the channel does. And this, of course, at the price of a reduction of rate, because instead of using all the possible symbols, we use only half. Okay. But now, clearly, when you have a channel, for example, like this, which is the most famous communication channel, it's called the BSC, where the input is 0, 1, and the, alphabet, uh, the output is also 0, 1, and you have transition probability 1 minus P, 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 and 1 minus P. So this is called the binary symmetric channel, or B. S, C. Now you see immediately that this trick doesn't work. There is no subset of symbols that gives you disjoint outputs. In fact, I could select only symbol 0, but then I can only transmit the old 0 code word that carry basically no information because it's just the old 0 code word. Right? So how do we generalize this idea? Well, in order to generalize this idea of selecting a small number of inputs to have disjoint uh, output sets, we have to go to high dimension. So these, this reasoning was on a symbol by symbol basis. We send a symbol, make a decision. Send a symbol, make a decision. The trick that more in general, we have to look at the, the high dimensional sequences of length n symbols and look at the output of length n symbols. And instead of making a symbol by symbol decision, we will make a block by block decision. And thanks to this going to the high dimension, we will see that in high dimension, conceptually, every channel behaves like this noisy typewriter example. But of course, the jump from one dimensional, symbol by symbol, to high dimensional has to be handled a bit, uh, you know, in a clever way. It's not an immediate thing that follows like so intuitive. So we can state the channel coding theorem for DMCs, and then we will dedicate some time to prove it. Mm -hmm. And this is the main result of this section. So this uh, theorem 15, channel coding theorem, says the capacity of a DMC x, p, y, x, uh, y given x, y, is given by, and we have, therefore, an explicit formula, the maximum of the mutual information between x and y maximized with respect to the input probability distribution px. As a note, notice that the channel specifies only the transition probability distribution, but the mutual information is a function of p x comma y, which is p x times p y given x. So this, let me underline in orange, this is fixed by nature, is given by our channel. But these, the input distribution, I underline in green, is something that we can choose. And maximizing the mutual information with respect to the input probability distribution gives us the channel capacity. Of course, this is a completely non-obvious statement because the way we have defined the channel capacity in the operational way, as supremo achievable rates, well, doesn't immediately lead this expression. So we have to prove it. We have to prove that for every rate r less than c, there exist codes with vanishing probability of error, and for every rate r bigger than c, such codes do not exist. So there are two different things here. Is one is to prove that this formula gives us the channel capacity. 
The second thing is, given a channel, compute the channel capacity. Now, the computation of the channel capacity is a simple maximization problem. In fact, if you remember, we know that the mutual information we say is a function of px and py given x. So the mutual information can also be written, if you remember, as p as an information function of the probability vector p, comma the probability matrix big P, where this is the probability vector corresponding to p sub x, and this is the probability matrix corresponding to py given x. Now we also know that this function, if you remember from concavity and convexity properties that we have uh, seen in, uh, at the beginning, the mutual information for fixed transition probability matrix is a concave function of the input probability mass function. So here, P, Y given X is fixed because it's defined by the channel, and we optimize with respect to px, so we are maximizing a concave function over a convex set because px is a probability vector and therefore it is a point in the probability simplex which is a convex set. So the computation of capacity is a convex maximization problem that can be handled by various methods but it is a tractable problem. We will see at the end of this, uh, of this chapter an algorithm that is called the Blehat Arimoto algorithm, which is a, a way of uh, numerically computing the channel capacity, so doing this maximization, which is specific using properties of information theoretic quantities. Of course, since it's, it's a convex maximization problem, what you can do is also pl plug it into a general optimizer. For example, CVX is an optimization package that solves convex maximization problems in MATLAB, and you would achieve the same result, but you are not exploiting the structure of the problem. The Blehat Arimoto algorithm is an algorithm that uh, uh, does this maximization in a provable way, so it achieves the optimum uh, by really exploiting the properties of the problem. However, in some cases, we can also get explicit. Uh, closed form expressions for the channel capacity, which is also nice. For example, here is the example of the BSC that we have already seen before. So the BSC, which uh, corresponds to this transition probability matrix, can also be written in an additive noise form as y equal to x plus z, where this plus is modulo 2, so it's on the binary field, and where z is a noise sequence, is a noise variable that uh, is equal to 1 with probability p. So what happens if I send a 0, x equal to 0, right? What happens if I send a 0 and the noise is 0? Well, 0 plus 0 gives me y equal to 0. But if z is 1, this gives me 0 plus 1, 1. So if z is 1 with probability p, I have a transition from 0 to 1 with probability p. And if it is 0 with probability 1 minus p, I have simply the transition from 0 to 0. The same thing for 1. If x is equal to 1, if x is equal to 1, and z is 0, 0 plus 1, I receive y equal to 1. If z is equal to 1, 1 plus 1 modulo 2 is 0, I receive y equal to 0. So again, we have here, let me use a different color, for example, pink. If I send 1 and the noise is 0, I receive 1, so we probably 1 minus p. If I, receive, if I send 1 and the noise is 1 with probability p, I receive 0. Okay? So this transition probability can also correspond also to this so-called additive noise form where the noise is binary, x is binary, and the addition is modulo 2. This is useful in the computation of the channel capacity because now we can reason as follows. We say, okay, 
C is the maximum of the mutual information with respect to the input probability distribution. Now I write the mutual information as the entropy of the output minus the entropy of the output given the input. It turns out that, well, the output y is x plus z. So this is entropy of x plus z given x. When I condition, right, uh, then this x is a constant. So entropy of x plus z given x, because entropy is invariant by translation, is the same as x entropy of z. This is a general property that uh, entropy is invariant by translation, which means if I just add a constant to a random variable, the entropy doesn't change. And since x here is conditioned, so it acts as a constant, then I have this property. But z is a binary, is a Bernoulli random variable, so its entropy is the binary entropy function calculated in p. So we have that uh, at the end, our maximization problem, so this term does not depend on the input distribution, it depends only on the noise distribution. So it's fixed. So our... Um, Maximization is basically just maximizing the entropy of the output. But this is very easy to do because, as you can see here, this channel is it's called a symmetric. It turns out that if you use uniform input, so you put probability one half on zero and one half on zero, well, also the output will be uniform. You can just compute the probability of the output and you will see that uh, is also one half, one half. Okay, how do you see this? Well, you just take the vector one half one half times the probability matrix one minus p p p one minus p. So this is p x times p y given x gives you p y. You do this multiplication, right? So row times colon you get one half. Row times second colon you get also one half. So it means uniform inputs gives you uniform output. So clearly, this is the choice because the uniform probability, probability mass function maximizes the entropy. So this is just log 2. Log 2 in bits is 1. So at the end, we find that the capacity of the BSC is 1 minus the binary entropy of P, right? And in particular, if P is 1 half, this is 0. So if the noise flips bits with probability one half, this becomes a useless channel because somehow the input and the output becomes independent. If the noise flips bits with a very small probability, so p is very small, then h of p is also very small, and this, prob the, this capacity is close to one bit per symbol. It will be slightly less than one bit per symbol, okay? Which means we cannot transmit reliably at exactly one bit per symbol that would be transmit all possible binary sequences. We have to restrict, we have to use a code book, but the, the, the code rate, coding rate can be very high. In fact, can be as close as we want to one minus the binary entropy in P. We can have another exercise of computing capacity explicitly. So this other example uh, considers a another very important channel model, which is called the binary erasure channel. So here, in this case, the input alphabet is binary, zeros and ones. The output alphabet is ternary and has symbol zero, one, and then we have an additional term, let's call it E, or, I don't know, it shouldn't be called E because I already put, uh, already called E the probability of this, so let's call it question mark, okay? This is called erasure. So this channel is very, very, very important in the so-called application layer coding. We will see a little bit later when I, I'm going to talk about channel coding that uh, when you have a transmission protocol at the physical layer, 
this transmission protocol passes on uh, up to upper layer, for example, to the internet protocol layer, so the, the so-called net network layer, packets of information. Now, these packets of information typically do not contain errors because there, is, there are already error control mechanisms at the physical layer such that if a packet is corrupted, it's simply erased, is marked as missing, and is not passed above. So when you now look at uh, the coding between, say, a server and a client, and underneath there is a network with its uh, protocol stack, the server and the client exchange packets, but these packets go through the network, and some of them get erased. They are simply lost in the network, and some of them are delivered to the destination. Now, if you want to code on top of that to take care of these erasures, this is called application layer coding, and it's actually used. It's used in modern communication systems a lot. Right? And basically, the underlying model is precisely this model. So it's a packet erasure channel, but conceptually, is uh, if these packets are reduced to single bits, which of course is not practical, but conceptually we can think of this, we have a binary erasure channel. So this is a channel that does not flip bits. You will never have a zero becoming a one, or a one becoming a zero. Simply, a bit scan remains the same, no errors, or it can be erased. So this is a very useful model to represent this, uh, uh, say, end-to-end -end coding when underneath there is a protocol stack that does error control and may erase and lose packets. Okay. So what is the capacity of this binary erasure channel? Well, we do the same thing as before, but of course we have to be smart. At the end, we have to solve a maximization problem. In this case, we want to solve the maximization problem in closed form, which is not always possible. In this case, it is possible, but we uh, before, you see, it was convenient to expand the mutual information in terms of entropy of y minus entropy of y given x. But in this case, it is convenient to do the, the opposite. We expand the mutual information in terms of entropy of x minus entropy of x given y. Why we do so? Because now we have the entropy of x here. Now, what is the entropy of x given y? Let's see. Entropy of x given y is, we can write it as p of y equal to 0 entropy of x given y equal to 0 plus p y equal to 1 entropy of y uh, of x given y equal to 1 plus p of y equal to question mark erasure times entropy of x given y equal to question mark okay this is by definition of conditional entropy. You can always break the conditional entropy into the expectation with respect to the condition invariable of the entropy given specific values of the condition invariable. And now we see that if uh, y is equal to 0, x deterministically is equal to 0. There is no other possibility. If we receive a 0, it means that uh, the input is 0. So this entropy here, this one, is equal to zero because x is a deterministic function of y in this case. This entropy here, same thing, if we receive one, we know deterministically that uh, x is one, so this is also equal to zero. Now, if we receive an erasure, we see that with equal probability, x can be zero or one, which means that x does not depend on y when y is an erasure. This condition is ineffective. So this entropy at the end is simply the probability of erasure E times the entropy of x. Now I'm doing fast, okay? If you, you can fill in the gaps of what I'm saying, but otherwise it takes too, uh, too long time. So whatever I say is correct and is mathematical. If I do some jumps sometimes. It's your job to fill it in the, in, in the gaps. And if you don't understand, then you can ask me. OK, so we, this is a, a way to compute this entropy of uh, x given y. is simply 
probability of erasure times entropy of x. So we can, uh, at the end, uh, write the mutual information in this way as 1 minus the probability of erasure times the entropy of x. Now we want to maximize this with respect to the uh, probability mass function of x. So what we can do, x is a binary variable. It's a, the maximum entropy is one bit obtained by uniform one half, one half. And therefore, the capacity is simply one minus the probability of erasure. Mm -hmm. Which, in a certain sense, is the fraction of non-erased symbols received, which, in a certain sense, is, very intu is a very intuitive result. But it's not so intuitive if you, if you think that uh, this is the rate at which I can correct all the erasures. One thing is to say, okay, I receive a fraction of unerased symbols 1 minus e. Right, because the probability of erasure is e, so the probability of non-erasure is 1 minus e. If I send a long sequence of symbols, the fraction total uh, uh, received symbols over total transmitted symbols is going to be 1 minus e. But this says that if I encode information using a code at this rate, I can actually correct all the erasures. So at the end, my information message is correctly recovered. There will be no erasure left because I have you know, a code and I have not transmitted that rate above this number. Okay? So, seems intuitive when you say it, but it's not so intuitive if you think what it means, right? And actually finding codes that do this erasure correction is not an easy task. We will see some examples, maybe in the future, when we talk a little bit about channel coding, but it's absolutely non-trivial huh, to find codes that are, in fact, so explicit algorithms that can correct the erasures at a rate arbitrarily close to 1 minus the probability of erasure. Okay. So, I want to give some other general principles for channels for which it is relatively easy, or at least you have a good chance, to find the capacity in closed form. And then we stop, and then in the second half, we are going to uh, prove the channel coding theory. So, a class of channels that is uh, quite uh, nice is the class of symmetric channels. And in particular, we talk about strongly symmetric channels, are those channels for which the transition probability matrix has the property that every row is a permutation of the first row and every column is a permutation of the first column. Just to give you an example, the BSC is strongly symmetric because the BSC, the probability matrix, is 1 minus P and P, and then the second row is P, 1 minus P. So you see that the, the, the second row is simply a permutation of the first, the second column is simply a permutation of the second, of, of the first, okay? So this is a strongly symmetric channel. And then we define a weakly symmetric channel that uh, has the property of the rows, but not of the columns. For example, the BEC is a weakly symmetric channel. Why? Because the transition probability matrix for the BEC uh, is 1 minus E, E. 0, and then 0, e, 1 minus e. So you see that uh, the second row is a permutation of the first, but here we have uh, this column is not a permutation of the first column, okay, in general, is not. So uh, uh, this is a weakly symmetric channel. So for strongly symmetric channel, we have essentially an explicit form for the capacity we can easily show that uh, the capacity is always achieved by uniform inputs, so letting the, in the inputs with uniform probability, and it's going to be simply logarithm of the cardinality of the output minus the entropy function of the first row of the probability matrix. Uh, maybe we're going to see this in a, in, as an exercise uh, in the live uh, lecture. For weakly symmetric channel, you can show that uh, the capacity is given by 
maximizing the probability of the output with respect to the input minus the entropy function applied to the probability mass function of the, the, the first row of the probability matrix. Okay? But uh, this maximum may not be obtained by uniform inputs, and so we cannot go further in general. Mm? For strongly symmetric channel, we can also show that this maximum is just a log of the cardinality of the output, because there is, uh, for a strongly symmetric channels, we have this property that uniform inputs make uniform outputs. So to maximize the entropy of the output, you make it a uniform probability, which is achieved by uniform inputs, and this is why you get log of cardinality of y. Uh, for the maximum entropy of y. Okay? Uh, just as a note, in general we have a class of channels that are additive noise channels for which is a generalization of the, B, of the BSC uh, idea. Uh, the output and uh, the, the input and the output alphabet are a finite field, FQ, uh, and p y given x is induced by simply adding noise. So I transmit letter x i. The noise is a symbol in, uh, and this addition, this addition defined in the field. F Q. Okay? In particular, if Q is equal to 2, this is the binary field, and this is addition modulo 2. Many of you may have not seen finite fields in their life because this is not the standard background of uh, engineers. But when you go into channel coding theory, you will see a lot of uh, finite fields. Here in this course, we just mentioned them. Don't be overly worried. If you want a simple example, just take, for example, q equal to a prime number, for example, q equal to 7, or q equal to, I don't know, 13, and then the finite field fq coincides with the so-called integer residue modulo q, which means the addition is modulo q when q is a prime. So q equal to 2 gives you the binary field, q equal to 3 is also prime, give you the ternary field, q equal to 5, q equal to 7. There are finite fields that are more complicated than that, they are called extension fields, but okay, we will not uh, talk a lot about these things, at least not now. Anyway, it turns out that uh, for these additive noise discrete channels, it's very easy to show that the transition probability is simply the distribution of the noise, Pz, calculated in y minus x. And this, because of the translation property of the field, when you add something modulo, you keep, you know, uh, rotating on the same on, in, in, in the same uh, set of numbers because the field is closed under addition, imagine the modulo 2 or the modulo 3 or the modulo 5, hmm? it, it, this implies that the every additive noise channel for every field is always strongly symmetric, so the capacity of these uh, channels is uh, simply given by log of the size of the alphabet y, which is q, so log q, minus the entropy of the noise variable. So this generalizes the 1 minus binary entropy uh, h of p uh, that we have seen before for the, for, the, for the BSC to these symmetric additive noise channels. Okay? So we stop here, and uh, in the next block, we are going to uh, finally go through the proof of uh, the channel coding theorem. Uh, and in particular, we are going to prove uh, the direct part, which is the existence of codes uh, with vanishing probability of error for rate uh, below capacity. And this is uh, um, so called achievability. 
And then the converse part, the non-existence of codes of, with vanishing error probability for rate above capacity, which is called the converse part. Okay, let's stop here and uh, continue later.